Well, good morning. Uh, this is Erica um, Sharon, and uh, welcome to the journey. And um, let me just share a little bit about what the journey is about. Um, the journey is um, a podcast that just try to captures um, conversations with ordinary people who've either had setbacks in their life, who've had some type of struggles, where they have had an opportunity, or there need to be an opportunity for them to recreate themselves and transform um, themselves through through some type of um, adversary, um, adverse things happen in their life. It could be in business, it could be in in life, some type of activity they were involved with, or maybe sometimes even something more tragic than that. So, um, so Erica, welcome. Thank and, you. Um, I'm excited to be here. We have a, uh, I know at least one mutual friend uh, mm-hmm. that that introduced us, and I'm I'm so grateful for Lori for 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 that. Um, and when too. we talked last week or a couple weeks ago about your story, it sounds pretty. Uh, very interesting. I'm looking forward to everyone hearing it. Um, but before we jump into that, um, if you could just share a little bit about um, not only who you are, but what do you do for fun? So uh, why don't you start off with what do you do for fun? Okay, so um, for fun, I would say, um, and this will probably be a little bit later in my story, but I paint boards. Um, but that's yeah. that's my job. But I absolutely love it, and it's very uh, therapeutic to me. Cool. I run. Oh. Um, I find that to be fun and also um you know therapeutic um and when you say run because it, mm-hmm. i just started like going into wincing pain when you said run. no i'm just joking <laughs> what do you mean like run like how what's like long um, distance or so yeah i started out um three years ago when i was trying to get sober i started out um going you know like two miles um three miles i had done it years back but then through my rough part of life i had stopped so okay. um i started running because i liked what it did for my mind I like to run outside Um, I like nature so um, I did that and then um, did some 5k's and then last September I did my first half marathon oh okay yeah I cried when I crossed the finish line (laughs) Um, and then um, this past May I did the Ragnar for the first time okay and it was and tell us about what the Ragnar so the Ragnar um, it doesn't sound fun Um, and I was very skeptical about it because I find running to be something I kind of like to do alone like a personal thing to clear my head. Um, I don't really like to talk to friends while I do it. But anyway, for the Ragnar, you have two vans. Um, I think there were six people. Yeah, there were six people in each. So it's a team of 12 people. We ran from um, Chicago, like Waukegan, to Madison. So it took over 24 hours. And um, yeah, so you have, each person has three legs in the run. So my legs were like um, 6.2, 6.2, and like five and a half. So, and then, um, you know, the the next person, so it's like a relay. So you're not all running at the same time. And you sleep in the van. You bring like plastic bags to put your sweaty clothes in. Like it was, it was one of the hardest things mentally that I did. I remember um, my night leg was at 10 o'clock at night. It was raining. Um, I was on the highway. So there's cars going like 55 it, um, up and down hills. Wow. It was it was crazy. But there were all these people um, behind you and in front of you with flashing lights on. Sure. And it was like they were just like pushing. Like mm-hmm. you knew everyone else was doing it so you could do it. So right. I like to do like bucket list things. Okay. And that was one thing that I wanted to do. And I thought I would never do it again. <laughs> but I would. I totally would I met okay. some great people um, you know we became friends I only knew one of the people okay. in the minivan my cousin okay. um, so I I loved it and um, actually three weeks ago I went for a run and something was just missing in my life and I realized it was last year when I trained for the half marathon I loved the fact that like I didn't make any excuses you know you wake up in the morning and you're like oh do I feel like running oh maybe I'll just get on the elliptical maybe I'll do this and I missed like that drive I had within myself so I committed to doing the half marathon again um, this September 28th so I it's I guess you learn to love it. Yeah. I like the way I feel after. 
after. Sure, I sure. Run. Well, you know what what you just mentioned um, was the benefit of having that that daily structure and having that discipline, mm-hmm. right? So yep. I think I think there is that element that um, when we have that structure in life, then and then there's also a sense of purpose for that too. Yes. And so and it doesn't necessarily always have to be to compete against other people or to be you know a champion at something, but that element of having that structure and then having that choice, am I going to be disciplined about this or not? Yep. But if we don't have those things set up, goals or the structure, you just wake up and kind of wayward all right. day. So. And I also, um, after I did, committed to the half, I put it out on Facebook, like, do I have any friends who would want to, you know, who aren't runners and would want to do the 5K? Or do I have anyone who would want to do the half marathon? And um, there were about, I said, I'll create a separate little Facebook group. We can encourage each other. You know, I won't necessarily meet with you to run because I do consider it, you know, like I, I need to make sure I'm running at my pace. Yep. You know, it's for myself. Mm-hmm. And um, I had about 20 women say, yes, like I want to be in the group. So I have some friends who, for them, they were never runners and they're up to like the two and a half, three miles and they're going to do the 5K. Nice. And we encourage each other. And I have one friend who's doing the half with me. Nice. And so so, like this morning, I knew she was waiting at the trail at 6 a.m. for me. So, I got my butt out of bed and got there, and we both put in our headphones. We don't talk, but just knowing that that other person is yeah. there helps a lot. So. Helps with the accountability and yeah. everything. Nice, mm-hmm. nice. I also, for fun, love to play bingo. Oh, really? Love to play bingo. <laughs> yep. Um, so, um, there, Roscoe has like a fall fest. And okay. a few years ago, I sat there with my girlfriend and we played, and it's cheap, mm-hmm. you know, fun. And we just sit there and we laugh and laugh. And so, I um I love to play bingo. I love to garden. Okay. Um and I love to cook. Mm, okay. So not um and read. I don't okay. always take enough time for those things. Sure. But like if I had a perfect day, um it would be that and spending um time with my family. Gotcha. So when you say gardening, um like vegetable gardens, flowers, both. both? Okay. Uh-huh. I love perennials um okay. that come up every year. Sure. Um I love to go you know look at them, plant new things, split them. Um, my husband takes care of the vegetable garden. Okay. Um, he considers himself like the master with that. So okay. um, I I help, you know. And uh, last night I went out and picked a ton of tomatoes and we made salsa. I like to do that, but like that's more his thing, and sure. I do the flowers. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, so you guys will both share the duties in the kitchen, right? And do some uh, things together, or no? yeah, he will. Like if I ask for help with the cooking, okay. Um, he has his like specialties, okay. like biscuits and gravy is his thing. Okay. Um, um, so if I ask for help, you know, he will. And the salsa is something we do together. We freeze okay. it, and then we take it, like, to parties and stuff all winter. And, oh. and he loves that. So, okay. yeah, we, we do share share things in the yard. Like, we both have the things we enjoy, and we sure. try to stick to that. Okay, perfect. And your husband's name is? Um, David. David. And I should say congratulations because it's only been mm-hmm. a short time period, Yeah, right? almost six months. Six months. Okay. Yeah. And so so you and David got married in March, right? Yes, in Punta Cana. Oh, nice. Yeah. The weather was beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, it yeah. was like the most perfect day, like more perfect than I could have ever perfect. imagined. So, the, so is March what? What's the date of March? Um, March 9th. March 9th. I okay. always get it confused. It's funny because his birthday is March 6th. And okay. for the longest time, I would say his birthday was March 9th. Okay. And he would always tease me and he'd be like, no, flip it upside down because it's the 6th. So now sure. it happens that our anniversary is on the 9th. So every time I'm like, oh, shoot, is it March 6th or March 9th? <laughs> but our anniversary is March 9th. Gotcha. And how long have you and David mm-hmm. been together? Um, we met almost six years ago this October. Okay. Um, he, we had a, a breakup of six months in between there. So we had been back together about like, I think four. Um, we met, he, my son has always played uh, football okay. ever since he was in like first grade for the Rockton Roscoe Lions, junior Indians. Okay. And they had two teams at that age level and Dave coached the other team. Okay. So, um, one day our two teams played. Okay. And uh, he, oh, like he says, and we beat you. <laughs> they beat us. He <laughs> adds that in all the time. And uh, we, uh, you know, the parents were up on the hill afterwards. Um, 
drinking some beers <laughs> back when I still drink. And um, he's, he told um, a friend, hey, can I, I want to meet her. Mm. And so we met, and there was actually a surprise birthday party I was going to that night, and one of our mutual friends invited him to come along. And I was like, seriously? Like, this is going to be so awkward. You know, <laughs> I just met him. And and uh, so then, like, the next week we went out on a date, and he was different from anyone I had ever dated. Okay. And um, I, you know, what I'd been trying hadn't been working out very well for me and I thought I'm going to give this a try and we've been through we've been through you know a, a rough road and he you know he stuck by me and is so supportive okay. so he's okay. yeah nice so so let's go ahead and we'll start getting into a little bit of your story but let's kind of give me a little bit we'll, we'll kind of go backwards just a little okay. bit but so you so Dave's your husband yes. currently for six mm-hmm. months but you guys been together almost six years yeah. and then you obviously have a son and yes. what, what's his name and how old is he um my son's name is um Dylan he's okay. 15 he'll be 16 in November okay and he goes to Hanunaga yes okay. today was his first day okay. he's a sophomore sophomore Okay. And then I have a daughter, okay. um, Morgan. She is 17. She'll be 18 in January. She um, is a senior. Okay. Yep. So she had her first uh, or her last first day today. Sure. Okay. And um, then I have a stepson, okay. um, Tyler. Okay. And um, he is uh, my son's age. So okay. he's um, 15. Gotcha. And so he started his sophomore year. Sophomore year. And he goes to Hanadig as well? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and so... Uh, so I, um, so you were married once before. You had yes. mentioned married once before, mm-hmm. and um, and when when was that? From when to when? Um, I got married when I was eighteen. Okay. Um, and got divorced. Uh, I think it was seven years ago. Okay. So it would have been like tw- married about I think like thirteen years. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and, you know, did you grow up around here or? Yes, in Rockton. Okay, so you went to Hanunaga mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Yes, through oh. ninth grade, and then I actually homeschooled the last oh, three okay. years. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do you have siblings? Uh... Um. <laughs> so I had, um, um, you know, I don't really like the term like half or step or you know whatever, because yep. in our house, like you know, we're all family. It's sure. your your brother, your sister. Um, but I had one um, real brother. Okay. Um, he was three years younger than me. Okay. Um, I lost him when I was um. 21 and he was 18 he was a senior in high school and um i had a i also have a half brother um he didn't um know that i existed until he was about eight years old Mm -hmm. so we're we're close now but i didn't i didn't know him growing up at all okay and how old is he now he is turning 30 we're 10 years apart so i'm turning 40 in um january and he turns 30 okay all right and you you said your brother died when he was 18? Yes. And how did he die? Um, He committed suicide. Oh, did he? I'm sorry to hear mm-hmm. that. Yeah, he crashed his car um, one night, um, but it, it was on purpose. He made the phone call first, and mm. he had um, threatened it before. He had been in Singer that um, December before, okay. and um, yeah. Mm, I'm sorry to hear that. It's a, um, it's a tough, a, a whole, whole other tough thing. It is. Um, I found out, I actually found out two weeks after that that I was pregnant with my daughter. And um, I always tell her, you saved me because I I couldn't pull it together. He was um, my best friend. And I I was going to the grave every day and just crying and I, I couldn't function. Yeah. And um, two weeks later, I found out that I was pregnant with her. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people said, you have to get your act together mm-hmm. because you'll lose the baby if yeah. you don't you know, stop this. I would shake and cry and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, she gave, it gave me like this purpose. And, um, I looked at the way that my brother and I were raised and, um, some of the things that I felt led up to, to him making that decision. And, um, I was like, I'm going to be the best parent that I can be. I'm not, I'm yeah. Okay. So, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what was growing up like? Because I, I'm and I'm sorry, you and I've already spaced it out. You said your brother's name is um, my brother that died. His name is Josh. Josh. Okay. Yep. And then my half brother, his name is Dustin. Dustin. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, but Josh and you mm-hmm. uh, were 
close, yeah, we obviously, were growing up. raised right? together, yeah. And so, so yeah, tell us a little bit about, because you kind of uh, implied that there was, there were some difficulties <laughs> growing up. So, so. Yeah, I guess, you know, like, when people ask me about my story, um, I guess I never really... Um, felt sorry for myself or like considered that maybe I had a traumatic childhood mm -hmm. um, because I was never hit. You know, yeah. I would, I would, I always had food and clothes mm -hmm. and, you know, a place to live. Right. And so I knew that a lot of people had it um, a lot worse than me, sure. you know? So, um, I guess it wasn't until I started kind of working through some of my, my issues that I had in adulthood that I, I really started saying some things out loud and saying, wow, I guess maybe that affected me a lot more than I, you know, let myself feel. Right. Um, and so, um, my parents, um, um, obviously, well, they were married when they had me and then had my brother and, um, they got divorced when I was five. Um, my mom um, changed her religion, okay. um, and it, it it wasn't a small change. Um, someone um, knocked on her door, and um, she became um, a different religion. And it was a religion where they don't do holidays, they don't do birthdays. Um, it it's a whole different way of life. And for her, that's what she felt she needed to do at that time. Okay. And um, my dad was um, Catholic, okay. and my dad was not having it. Um, they were fighting all the time. Um, it, it was not a good situation sure. and, um, no peace whatsoever and very divided. I was a little girl and I would, I would go around quoting scriptures because that was all I heard yeah. at home. And they were both, um, at five years old, just sitting me down and having talks with me about what the, you know, why that was wrong and why this was right. And, you know, about the religion and, um, so at that point, um, was dad, uh, dad had become part of this, uh, had he aligned with your, with your mom at that time? Oh period? no, he no, never. No. So, yeah. he, so he was saying from a Catholic, uh, from Catholicism, what was, what this was is right the right way. And oh. my mom was saying, you know, and I, and, and, oh, okay. and I'm not going to, you know, name her religion just yeah. because I, you know, there's a lot of people in that religion that, that, you know, I still care a lot about and, and that religion were my mom is still that religion and it works for her mm -hmm. you know and um, I don't disagree with a lot of the the biblical teachings you know from that religion it's the emotional part um, mm -hmm. that gets added into it and the judgmental um, part of it sure. and um, so yeah my dad was you know Catholic and my mom became this other religion and um, they ended up getting divorced because my dad just said I can't do this this sure. isn't what I signed up for when we got married and I'm not raising my kids like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so he um, went on to get remarried, I think about maybe like three years later, mm -hmm. and they shared custody of us. Okay. Um, I would go like every other weekend with my dad and then um, all summer. Um, that was very hard on me. Um, I, they... They weren't um, peaceful in their dealings, so it was kind Mom of. Mom and Dad weren't peaceful with oh, each other. Oh no, okay. no, it was always constant fighting. And um, I remember like sitting at my dad and stepmom's house, and you know the court papers said that my mom could pick me back up on a Sunday night at six. So you better believe if she was sitting out there at five fifty, I would have to sit on the front porch and watch it, it, her sitting out there, and I wasn't allowed to go out until that mm -hmm. time. I wasn't allowed to hardly talk to her on the phone when I was with them. Um, I had to leave certain clothes at their house and not wear them to her house. Like everything was separate and their issues as adults were completely put on my brother and I. Okay. And um, so it got to the point, I think I was nine years old. Um, and it, you know, I, I will never understand um, in my heart, like why it came to this with with my dad and and my brother and I. However, what would happen is we would go over to my dad's house and I would say, "I'm not opening up my Christmas presents because that's wrong in God's eyes." Mom said, "You know, I." He'd be like, "Let's go find your Easter basket." At eight years old, no, no, not doing it. Like everything, and he had you know, two kids, two stepkids then. Mm -hmm. So he was like, look, we have our family here. And everything was a battle when I, when my brother and I would go over there because 
we, my mom taught us that there was one right way to do things, mm-hmm. and it was that religion. So my dad's way was wrong. So, so do you think at that point, and I know it's hard, so this is more of a question and don't necessarily know the exact answer, but do you think at that point was it um, not wanting, you were standing up, in this case standing up against dad, right? right? Mm-hmm. Was it about wanting to be aligned or um, please mom, or had you internalized it from from what she was saying as if this was a, 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 a truth via her teachings? Not just her teaching, but um, from in the my mind, I wanted to please God. Please like, God. Okay. Yes, because in my mind, um, what she was teaching me was I needed to do these things to be acceptable to God and to make God happy. Okay. So was it about pleasing my mom? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe a little bit, but it was um, in me from a very young age that what I was doing was either making God happy or sad, okay. and that was part of it. Okay, so mm-hmm. you had internalized those lessons. Yes. And, and okay, so that that had already come had come on, and now this, as you said, the house that was divided, right? <laughs> yeah. And now there's literally two homes. Oh, yeah. And, and Dad's trying to recreate himself and try to recreate this, yep. this family piece, but you had... Um, what, what's the saying? Uh, you had drank the Kool Aid, right? Um, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and understandably, you were young. I was and, eight. Yeah. yeah you like were, you, you believe what your parents tell you, right. you know. But I was with my mom more, right? And so I was more connected to that, I guess. And yeah. Well, and you said something also too that I think happens. Two things that stand out to me. One is that we don't know any different, right? If we're, yeah. we're growing up in this, if, if we grow up and into this particular we assimilate to that. We don't know any different. We have no frame of reference, right? And right. and the more closed it is, um, and the and the the more likely it reinforces itself all the time. Mm-hmm. And if there's a fear component to oh, it, and there is, and uh, even if that fear is d- not wanting to disappoint God, right? right um, let alone maybe some greater judgment that's happening. Yes. Um, it's it's very simple to go into that um, dualistic thinking. It's it's one of the the primary ways of us thinking anyways is right and wrong the more black and white it can be the simpler it is to teach Mm -hmm. and then of course as a young person you don't want to displease anyone so it's 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 easier to foul and color within the lines right there was um you know from from what my mom was teaching me of the religion there it was black and white there there was nothing in between yeah and so but a lot of times right the the problem then comes as we get older right Right. So, so when we're younger and we can, and, and we're taught things from a very black and white standpoint, we can we can become fully immersed in that, and our world is smaller, yes. and and our thinking is more concrete, mm-hmm. and it, and it's easier for that to happen. But as we get older, and we're naturally gravitating to start looking to the outside world mm-hmm. to figure out where we fit in and how do we fit in and what's going on, there's usually this transition that happens, yeah. um, and sometimes the more rigid it is, um, that foundational piece, um, even if it happens to be life-giving, even if it happens to be good, um, there's a tendency to push against it. Right. And and if it isn't pliable, mm-hmm. it can break and shatter versus bend with us. And so tell us a little bit about, uh, there was a, when did that start getting more complicated for you? Well, um, back to when I was, so then what ended up happening is my dad took my mom to court to get full custody of us mm-hmm. and um, I wanted to see both my parents mm-hmm. and I you know went before the judge like it, it was a it was like a major you know thing mm-hmm. and um, I basically said I wanted to live with my mom um, I couldn't imagine not being with my mom you know when I was little and but I wanted to see my dad too mm-hmm. and so the judge you know ended up saying that none of what was going on was good for my brother and I that they both both were doing, you know, emo- uh, emotionally abusing, you know, that that's what was happening. And um, he just said he thought that the best thing to do was put us with my mom. So my mom got custody of us. My dad could see us. I think it was one weekend a month. Yeah. And it's all you saw your dad was one weekend a month. Well, that's what the judge gave him. And I remember being, I, 
I think I was 10 and my dad coming over to our house and sitting out on a picnic table with me and he just said you know if if that's all that I'm worth right now um, I, I think that I'm not going to come get you at all and he said maybe our paths will cross again someday mm-hmm. and so um, I didn't see him again mm-hmm. until um, I would call him I would write him letters you know I was I was broken hearted how old were you? Um, I was 10 so um, you know and my brother Josh was in the background of all this I'm the one that had the talks with my parents yeah. you know I'm the one and he I guess somewhat shut it out you know he was younger than me he would be over there playing Atari or whatever and you know I would be the one in all these deep conversations of mm-hmm. you know my dad telling me why I shouldn't live with my mom with because of the religion and everything and so um you know my mom raised me by her in me and my brother by herself okay. um and um, I will always, you know, be thankful for everything mm-hmm. that she did for us um, as a single parent. Um, I know it was hard, yeah. you know, um, but I didn't have any other influence besides, you know, that that religion is how I was raised. And in that religion, you know, you're taught um, you do things with people in that religion, not in the outside world. And um, so that's your community. Yes. Outside of your house with mom and your brother, mm-hmm. the, the community was. Going to the going to the building, going to the church, or yeah. and um, and then that just probably just reinforced everything yeah. that was being taught at home, right? Because um, they want you to keep like those values, right. you know. And um, I started um, dating um, in 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 the whole time. You know, the thing is too is that it it wasn't just the religion. Um, my mom wasn't well um, um, through like like all of my teenage years. Um, we lived in a two bedroom apartment. We didn't have any money. Um, the rent, the rent went according to her income. Um, she cleaned houses. Um, I had to share a bedroom with her and a bed. So I never had my own space. Um, she, she just, she wasn't well. And at night, you know, she would cry and, and everything. And I'd be like, please just let me go to bed. I have school, you know, and she'd be like, no, if you care about me, you're going to stay up and talk to me. And, you know, if I would go to do something with my friends, like go to the mall, she'd say, why didn't you invite me? Like there was a lot of, and I think it's important to say, you know, that this is hard for me to talk about because I love both of my parents and I, you know, respect both of them. And, um, um, since then I've made amends, you know, with them. And so saying these things is hard for me because it's in no way meant to be hurtful, but it's also part of my story and what shaped me. So, um, you know, uh, there was, there was a lot of, um, mind games, I guess that were played and I don't necessarily consider it to be her fault. Um, you know, depression and anxiety, bipolar runs in my family. Okay. And um, if she was taking her medication, things were a lot better. Okay. And um, I was just made to be an adult and try to process things um, that she was saying when I was very, very young. Okay. And um, I thought that the things she was saying were normal and right. And I thought that I was, you know, crazy. And um it wasn't until later that I was like, oh, and you know, she realizes that now. She said, I never took time for myself. Mm-hmm. I, you know, she realizes that she wasn't well mm-hmm. and she's apologized to me for that, you know, and we've worked through it. But those things shape you, right. you know, in, yeah. in your mind. Yeah. Well, you know, when you started earlier saying that you decided um, uh, just recently that something was, you know, felt a little out of sync and things like that, and you just said, well, I need to get structure back in my life, right? And and I need to start w- running again. Well, I think sometimes when people are struggling, um, maybe with loneliness, maybe with a chemical imbalance, maybe with a combination of emotional regulation, different things going on, w- they're very then susceptible for um, an out- outside institution mm-hmm. that comes in very structured yes. because it answers all the questions. Mm-hmm. Even if the questions, even if the answers aren't correct, Mm-hmm. You you could just have to go from point A to point B, and as long as you follow along the lines, exactly, you become committed to it because it somehow makes the world make more sense. It's easier. Yep. Yes. It's black and white, and yeah. there's no questions, and that's where I really struggled when I left. 
I would ask everyone, like, do you think I'm do- this is the right thing? Do you think this is the right thing? Like, I literally could not think for myself yeah. at all. And so growing up, I was painfully shy. You know, in school, they'd be like, do you want to take this birthday cupcake? And I'd be like, no. And they'd be like, why? And I was so embarrassed. You know, because there's you don't fit in. There was nowhere in school that I fit in. You can't go to prom. You can't go to homecoming. You can't play sports. Um, and you can't go to, like, hang out with kids from school, you know, after school, anything like that. Um, so, you know, I just, I remember like liking this boy in ninth grade, but he wasn't in the religion. And I like wrote my friend a note, like, you know, oh, I like so-and-so. And And my mom went through my drawer and found it and just sat me down and had this like long talk with me about what was I thinking and all. And I mean, I, I thought, you know, God was upset with me and, it, it was just a, a very strict, um, yeah. you know, way of way of living, and I lived in fear of, you know, um, I guess her disapproval. I wanted to please her, and um, it it was just very rigid. And I started um, dating my husband that I married. Um, his name was Eric. Eric and Erica was cute while it lasted. <laughs> um, and um, I started dating him when I was. Um, f- 16, I think. And he was, you know, in the religion and his mom was one of my mom's best friends. Um, She helped me a lot because she could try to make sense of what emotions my mom was going through. And I could talk to her and try to, you know, say, I I just don't know what's going on, you know, and she could try to help. Um, and, And for once, I felt like I wasn't by myself. And, you know, Eric, even though it didn't end up working between us, um, which we'll probably get into that later, he helped me so much at that time with realizing, you know, you're, the way that the things your mom's saying, you know, maybe that's not spot on. You shouldn't beat yourself up about this. You shouldn't feel guilty. Um, I loved his family. Oh. Loved his family. His mom taught me how to cook. My mom was depressed a lot growing up. So, um, like, Eric's mom taught me how to cook and bake, and um, but we weren't allowed to go on a date without a chaperone. Um, I remember someone saw us, like he picked me up to go to like Wendy's for fast food one time, and someone from the the religion saw us and like told somebody. And my mom talked to me. She's like, "You can't do that." And I'm like, "We just went to get a hamburger, you know." Like, it, so you can't date without a chaperone. Um, you don't have sex before you get married. Don't live together, anything like that. And you know, I understand that that's you know from the Bible. Um, but I, so we got married, (laughs) you know, when, when we were 18 and wow, like you don't even know who you are yet, you know, you know, it's an interesting point piece that I want to throw out and for, for, you know, either parents out there or uh, soon to be parents or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting how Eric's mom came in and Eric were able to intervene in your life, able to uh, be that light in, yes. in your life. Mm-hmm. And they were able to help you process through some of the emotions. Yes. Um, but they could point out maybe some things that didn't seem right to them, right. Um, which you were already questioning anyways, right. but you didn't have to defend mom. Right. Where when dad probably said the same things, <laughs> but because mom was the culprit because of the their relationship not working exactly. and, and their conflict, you couldn't hear what was, what he was saying, even though he may have been saying the same message. Yeah, I didn't want to think bad of either of my parents. Correct. You know, that that hurts inside. Right, exactly. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing that they both may have been saying similar things, mm-hmm. trying to help you, right. um, but maybe the motives were different, um, right. or, or maybe not even the motives were different, but the tactic in which doing it, your, mo- your dad may have been so hurt because of the, this the disillusionment of his marriage, okay. um, or not being good, or not being enough for your mom, whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. um, that he couldn't get himself out of the way. Right, and where Eric and his mom were always like, "Okay, how can we try to fix it?" You know, like, "How can we have you be okay, and how can we have your mom be okay?" Right. You know, like, tried to, yeah. Yeah. So you were with Eric, uh, and then you had your two children. Yes. W- with Eric, mm-hmm. and then um, you were with him from eight, uh, from eighteen, uh-huh. and. You said for 13 years, right? Yes. So early 30s, like 31-ish and stuff like that. So we, um, it was during, you know, Eric was around uh, when my brother killed himself. um, And I will always be thankful for the help he gave me. Um, 
we we pulled up on the accident that night Mm -hmm. and um you know my brother had called my mom that night and he had been at a party and I don't know you know teenager things like he had seen a girl he liked and she was talking to someone else and honestly I think you know my brother was on medication too um he you know had problems like I said it runs you know in my family and um he you know, just couldn't see past that and called my mom from a payphone and said, I can't do this anymore. I love you. I love Eric and Erica. You know, I can't do this. And he hung up. So she called us and, uh, you know, we went kind of following, retracing. We knew where he had been and, and we, we pulled up on the accident and, um, you know, it, it was awful, you know, and, um, I felt like I failed him. You know, I, I just felt like, like he was my responsibility growing up Mm -hmm. you know I was supposed to protect him and I took the brunt of my mom and dad's talks and you know I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders Mm -hmm. and he didn't and I you know he had asked me a few weeks um before he died if he could move in with Eric and I Mm -hmm. and I said just wait till you're 18 and graduate because you know mom will say you need to stay there because you're not 18 yet but you can. So 18 can. was the magical age. I mean, in my mind, that he could have come but, with me. But at the same time, that is also when you could get married. That, Or maybe well, not could get married. That's when you guys did get married. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so he, you know, he couldn't see past that night. And, you know, I've had to work through a lot of emotions with that and realize that, you know, because... I I don't blame my mom and dad um, for him making that decision, but I definitely feel that there were things that happened in our life sure. and that that's the reason that it ended up like mm-hmm. that. And, um, you know, my dad at that point still wasn't in my life. Mm-hmm. So that night we had to call my dad okay. and tell him. And, you know, a big part of why my dad wasn't in our life as well was my, my stepmom, the person he married, was just not good to me and my brother said so many hurtful things and um we found out that night that he had left her and so they were going to get divorced and so that next week here we are like in a funeral home with my mom and dad like I hadn't seen my dad in since I was 10 well he came to my wedding but he didn't see me that day like he just sat there and then left Mm -hmm. so like I hadn't really had a conversation with him you know and here it's in this funeral home and Mm -hmm. there's all these emotions going through me and my parents still didn't get along you know it was just it was, it was a lot to, oh, to try to process but so yeah you hadn't seen him for 11 years and then under those circumstances <laughs> yeah sure. it, okay. it was a lot so I, I like I think I went through some trauma yeah. you know then and try and um yeah so uh we you know my parents were good through that together they hugged they you know it they were good through that together and um then and um, I found out I was pregnant with my daughter and um, I had my daughter and my son. Um, I started to heal with my dad then after my brother died because he he um, said he was sorry for not being there. He still placed a lot of blame on my mom, you know, in the religion, in the religion. He, he had carried a lot of hate inside of him. Um, but I was able to look at him. I won't forget it. The one night, like three nights after my brother died, um, Eric took me over to my aunt and uncle's and I sat there with my dad and I just said, I have to tell you that I feel that my brother may be here right now had you been in our life and not walked away that day at the picnic table, you know, because I felt guilty having a relationship with my dad because I felt like he was only saying he was sorry to me and coming back in my life because my brother was gone. Mm -hmm. And is that what it took? Mm -hmm. You know? And so I felt like, I felt like I was betraying my brother, Mm -hmm. um, by all of a sudden what I got my dad back in my life because he died. Mm -hmm. And so I had to come out and tell my dad that, Mm -hmm. and you know, he took it. He, he, he didn't he didn't try to defend himself okay. he cried and cried and you know what he put himself through that next year you know he didn't eat, he didn't you know was i saw it and there's there's nothing more that i could have said to him mm-hmm. he will always live with that you know, but we started to heal and he came back into my life. He was there when my daughter was born then, you know, nine months later. 
And, um, you know, the, now he's one of my best friends okay. and my biggest supporters. And mm. he is okay with me speaking my truth. Okay. You know, he, he owns it. And, you know, he'll cry sometimes when he, you know, hears it, but he's okay with it because we've, we've moved on. You had said that, um, uh, after, um, uh, Josh mm -hmm. had died, um, there was a lot of guilt on your part, just not only from the standpoint of how close you were, mm -hmm. um, but you were supposed to protect him and, yeah. and you were supposed to be, um, shield him from all these different things. Yeah. And, um, and then when your dad's back in your life, there's another guilt. So you were like this walking guilt um, oh, yeah. <laughs> sponge mm -hmm. um, so and um, and so uh, let's let's fast forward a little bit mm -hmm. and as as you obviously going through that was a major um, major struggle right mm -hmm. a major uh, setback that happened mm -hmm. and 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 thank goodness your your daughter was born mm -hmm. um, or you were pregnant with your daughter because then that gave you another thing to focus on yeah. and also as you said earlier a commitment, a vow that you were going to do it differently than your parents had. Yes. You were going to learn from what they didn't do right. Right. And then maybe the beginning of what your dad was trying to do right, you know, <laughs> right. at this point, you know, later on in um, your life. Um, and, and so you guys were married for a few years. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, your late 20s, early 30s, something started unraveling. What? Yeah. Well, d basically what happened was when my daughter started kindergarten, we were still um, in that religion. And when my daughter started kindergarten, I decided that, well, he had, my my husband had started to leave the religion mm. um, a couple years before that. But I was still hanging on because, you know, of our family, what, it's hard. Like, it's ingrained in you. And yeah. that that is your life. Um, you and know, in, guilt. in the guilt yeah. and feeling like God wouldn't hear my prayers yeah. and um, God w wouldn't be pleased with me. But I looked at my kids. And I could not raise them the way that I was raised. I, all I wanted was for them to be emotionally and mentally stable. I wanted them to feel like they could take on the world. And I didn't want them to feel like they had to hide. Mm -hmm. And so I left. Okay. And um, Left the religion. Yeah. Okay. When my daughter was in kindergarten. Okay. Well, what happened when we left the religion? Because you have to realize, I like never drank. I mean, after my daughter was born, I mean, I was 21 when I had her. Like, I maybe had one beer. Um, and then after she was born, I mean, I drank a couple times, but, like, never got drunk. Never. Like, I was always in control of everything. Um, you know, and part of that was the religion, but... but not all of it. Well, when we left the religion, I, I've i thought back a lot about this. And I feel like part of it was I felt like God just didn't approve of me anymore. So as long as he didn't, you know, approve of me and wasn't hearing my prayers, who cares what I did, you know? And the other thing was, I mean, we had never went to college. We'd, I'd never gone out to the bar, you know? And so we started going out. And when I started so we started kind of hanging out with people who weren't in the religion, right? And this it was this whole new world. And when I was drinking with them and partying and dancing, I felt like I fit in. Mm. Finally. Mm. Like, I felt not shy. Mm. I, I felt like it was this whole new world and it was exciting, mm. you know? And so we basically went through our party in college years then. Mm. But we had kids. Okay. We had a family, mm -hmm. you know, and we made some not so responsible decisions. Okay. And they ended up ruining our marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so it was things that we tried to recover from and couldn't. Um, you know, my ex husband, he. I think we all carry our own baggage, you know, through life. And the religion affected him in a different way. I was a perfect angel growing up. I never broke the rules, ever. Like, I, I never did. He was the one who would try to sneak and get out of things or, you know, he 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 was just, he handled it differently than I did. Sure. And, um, you know, there was just, um, you know, a lot of trust that was broken. Mm -hmm. And um, it... it I, I, I couldn't, um, get over it. Okay. And so finally I decided that, that, um, we needed to get divorced okay. and, um, 
you know, there's there's something. I was afraid because of the way it went with my parents' divorce. Mm-hmm. I was like, please, you know, I don't want to fight. I, do, I didn't want my kids to have that life. So I right. felt like I failed, but I also knew that what they were seeing in our day-to-day life, and I, I couldn't I couldn't let them live with that either. And um, so he, you know, to this day, I consider him a friend. Um, we've, after we shared the same lawyer when we got divorced, right. we have never gone back to court Mm. ever we don't we don't I mean we've had some arguments that's going to happen but we um, want what's best for our kids right and he's he's a he's a good dad nice okay good and that so one of the promises that you made right Mm -hmm. to yourself Mm -hmm. and then later when your kids were born Mm -hmm. was to do it different and when your daughter was in kindergarten right you saw the beginning of the world wasn't as small and this in this internal conflict Mm -hmm. now happens it's because it's all wrapped up together the way that I've heard you say it it's not only the family of origin stuff but then it's also the religion but then the religion ties directly into God and and God as you understand him and and so this is all wrapped up but then on the other on this other aspect you now see these two children and this little girl going to kindergarten garden and knowing that there's now a crossroad the world just got bigger and yeah. you can't you keep can't it hide inside. and so this 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 inner inner pass that happened um that you had to make some decisions now unfortunately he said this earlier too the more rigid somebody's grown up in the more legalistic and rigid and then you keep everything together with guilt right mm-hmm. when you then have time and opportunity to um think on your own there is none you know some people ask me about why is it that when the hebrews left egypt um, when they were liberated after 500 plus years of of slavery why did they have all these rules like in leviticus there's all these different rules and stuff like that I said well it was 500 years of slavery they didn't get to think for themselves mm-hmm. for such a long time so they needed much more uh, stronger guidelines on what to do how to do these different things and I think that also happens when, re- regardless of what it is, sometimes you can be, be that rigid um, and it not be religion. The downside with religion mm-hmm. being that rigid is then we tie God into it. Right. And so you always, you, like you said, once you believed you had displeased God, mm-hmm. then there was, and you couldn't be, you couldn't recover from that. So then it was hands off the wheel. Right? I was like, screw it. You know, it was like this spring yep. that had been held down and I I was like, D- yeah. Yeah, and then you add, <laughs> you you add to it all the elements of the lifestyle. You add alcohol. You add all, right. the, and it's, it has its own reinforcing loop, but no guidance on how to navigate through that. There's, oh no, right? no, and no, like I didn't really feel any guilt anymore, you know, because I was like, God's not, God doesn't approve of me anymore anyway. So, in in you know, I through that time there was an element where because my my ex husband was the one who was going out all the time um, with guys from work and everything. He started, you know, before I did. And then I would go out with him, Mm -hmm. you know. And um, then it started to be that he would be out at night and I wouldn't know when he was going to come home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't hear from him two, three in the morning, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes. And I was at home with the kids alone. Mm -hmm. Well, I started drinking at home alone. Okay, Like, that was my... The drinking started to be an everyday thing. Okay. And it was my way of dealing with, I don't know where my husband is. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know when he's going to come home, you know. And I would drink Mm -hmm. every night. Not, I wouldn't get drunk, but alcohol... Alcohol had my first drinking experience when I left the religion was basically it made me fit in. You know, I was like, oh, this is fun. Oh, yes, let's, you know, cut loose and not be uptight. And I always, always had a very busy mind. I always struggled with racing thoughts. Um, And so alcohol slowed them down. And so, you know, there were a lot of facets to it, like, as far as what alcohol did for me yeah. when I started when I started drinking, and then slowly it was, um, you know, it was fitting in, it was calming me at night um, until it was just a habit, yeah. you know, yeah. and then um, it started to be even even when I was with him, it was 
my episodes weren't in control with drinking. Okay. Um, you know, and he realized that I had a problem because he could drink and not do crazy things. You know, I started to have trouble when we would go to a party or out or whatever. Um, there was, ri- I, I had no stop button, mm-hmm. no stop button. It was like, let's party. Um, and I would black out. Like I wouldn't remember anything. Mm-hmm. I would um, throw up. I would be so hungover the next day. There was no nothing in control mm-hmm. about my drinking. Probably like from a year into my drinking, but I didn't realize I had a problem. You know, I didn't. I didn't know what alcoholism was. I d- I didn't realize what what was happening. Right. Okay. And and so you've gotten divorced. You get divorced. And when did that? When was that turning point where you go, okay, I do have a problem. I need to do something different. There's going to be... There were times when I was still married where he would say, I think you have a... Or I would say to him, I I think I have a problem. I need to cut back on drinking. Mm. Never did it occur to me that maybe I just had to stop altogether. Mm. So, you know, he would say, I'll stop with you, whatever. And I would start back up again. Like, it, it just wasn't... Life wouldn't be fun. So then we got divorced. And... I think it was right after we got divorced. I I was like, I have to go to AA. A- a- like I I didn't know where to look actually for help. But I remembered seeing, um, hearing a, fr- a friend's story on Facebook. So I messaged her and I'm like, What do I do? I think I have a problem. And um, and she said, Well, I'll meet you at an AA meeting tonight. Oh, I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Um, but they told me that I could never drink again, you know, and I was like, oh, no, like, I I just want to, you know, you to give me a little help and then like help me control the drinking, <laughs> right. like not drinking ever is not an option, you know. So I think over the course of like five years, I went back to AA probably like four times. I would get a sponsor. Um, I would last two to six weeks. Six weeks was the longest ever. And you have to remember, usually it was something pretty substantial that got my butt back there. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, it it wasn't small things, Mm -hmm. things that I'm embarrassed about, but I can talk about now because I've changed. But, um... Yeah, it was. It I, I couldn't stick with it though. I, life just wasn't going to be fun, and you know, I guess it. Sh- I should have realized because the there was never a day I woke up where it wasn't in my mind. Oh my gosh, can I can I drink? It, you know, I when is it going to be five o'clock? Mm-hmm. I want to drink. You know, normal people don't think like that, right. but I would surround myself with people who did think like that right. because then I seemed more normal. Right, right, right. Well, and I imagine <laughs> your background, right, because of the uh, the religious background, the household that you grew up in. When you go to ask for help, and they are coming across as pretty black and white, uh-huh. um, understandably so. Because because of the allergic reaction that alcoholics have with alcohol, um, there the first opposite, the first um, resistance to that is going to be like, even if it wasn't conscious, unconsciously you must have gone, oh here I go again. They're, they're going to take all the fun out of my life. Very similar to growing up years. Oh my goodness! Like I went to the AA meetings at first, and I was like, don't tell me I have to go to a certain number of meetings a week, like. <laughs> The thought of someone telling me that I couldn't do something, oh, I, w- I was just so resistant to it. Well, then they bring up God, and I'm like, oh, heck no. Like, I can't do this. Like, you don't understand. God, like, I wasn't praying because what I was taught was that since I left that religion, the one true way of doing things, God didn't listen to my prayers. Right. So then I g- try to go to AA, and, and you're totally, I'm glad you brought that up because that is part of what every time I'd be like, I can't do this Mm -hmm. because it seemed too rigid to me. You can't ever drink again. You're going to go through these steps and you need to bring God. I I know it's not always God, a higher power, you know, into your life, but boy, that was just going to be a lot of work, a lot of work. All old buttons that had never got addressed. (laughs) All old wounds that you hadn't addressed, right? Right. You had just just moved and then stopped and then found this whole other lifestyle. So I was like, I'll even do it on my own. Like I'll figure out some way to quit drinking, but I'm not doing this. Sure. 
So fast forward, mm -hmm. obviously, because we're talking, right? <laughs> something changed. Yeah. Right? And, and, and not only something changed, you, you've now been sober for how long? Um, it'll be three years in November. Okay. So you've been sober for three years and mm -hmm. that's a lot longer than six weeks. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so, something, so something shifted. Yeah. And, 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 and even though I know well, typically, right, it's mm -hmm. some kind of bottom, right? <laughs> yeah. As you said, get your butt back into the meetings, mm -hmm. but something must have changed within you. Something it changed did. within your heart. Something mm -hmm. softened, something opened up. It what, did. What, what happened? Well, I hit what I like to think was my rock bottom, but looking back at the time, it really truly wasn't completely that. Um, so th three years ago, what's today? The 19th. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, this Thursday, I hit, it was August 22nd. I hit what sh should have been my rock bottom. Um, you know, um, I, I was really depressed. I was drinking every day. I would wake up in the morning hungover, but I, I couldn't even function hardly. I would take like a sleeping pill after like I got the kids to school, whatever, just so that I could go back to sleep so that I could not think about life. Um, I could not deal with it until it was time that I could, you know, social acceptably drink again, you know, whatever I had, I was hiding it. And, um, you know, Dave, Dave stood by me. We were living together at the time, but he was over it, over it. When I drank, I got very confrontational. Um, I said things, I couldn't remember what I said. He, he was over it. Um, and I ask him now, like, why did you stick with me? Why did you do that? And he's like, I saw the good in you. Like, I knew it was there. I just knew you had to work through your demons. So, um, my, my ex-husband got remarried, mm -hmm. um, and it put me over the edge. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to get married again. I wanted to move on with life and seem like everything was okay. I, I wanted, um, Dave to marry me. And he was like, no, you know, not, not right now. This isn't the time. Obviously he saw my issues, you know, like why would he have? Sure. And, um, I was so angry that my ex-husband was moving on getting married and how could he, you know, be faithful to someone else? And, my life had been ruined, which wasn't completely sane thinking because we both did things sure. to destroy that marriage. But when I was drinking, I was always the victim mm -hmm. and, um, it was easier to blame things on other people. So I hit, like, I, I could not deal with life at that point. Um, and I tried to, I tried to fake it and, um, it was a Monday and I got drunk and I, um, Dave and I got into a fight. I think it was about getting married. <laughs> and um, I said that I didn't want to be here anymore. And um, I did. I, I, I wanted to be here. But I knew that if I didn't get help, I wasn't going to make it. And um, I, the only thing that was keeping me here was my kids. I didn't want them to go through what I went through when my brother died. <laughs> but I felt like I was adding nothing to this world, nothing. And I couldn't get a grip inside. And every day it was painful to wake up. And, um, I called my best friend and I said, I need you to take me to the hospital. And she was like, are you sure? And I'm like, I can't like, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do because I can't live this life anymore. Right. So she took me and that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, you know, I went to the psych ward for five days and, um, you know, saw people who were walking around with their throat slit, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm not supposed to be here. Like, I'm just a normal part. Like I'm, you know, and I, we'd, I'd go to the groups and they would have us sit and of uh, like what are well, the things that we wanted in our life that would make us happy. And then on the other side, the things that were keeping us from that, you know, and the things that I drew, I think were like a happy family life, marrying Dave, which so much shouldn't have been tied up in my happiness in a man. And I get that now. Mm -hmm. Um, and money, I was broke, mm -hmm. completely broke. And I was living with Dave, but I wasn't 
contributing my part, you know. Um, and the things that were on the side of that, I can't remember everything but alcohol was obviously one of them. Right. And I met with the doctor and I was like, if you could just get my medication right, because I, you know, and he's like, well, how much do you drink? I'm like, every day, but you just don't have my medication right. And if you get it right, then I'll be able to drink and be okay. You know? And he was like, you need to stop drinking for a while. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know? And I said I would. And um, I was like, I don't ever want to be back in here. You know, I, it was my bottom, but I remember Dave came to see me and um, he, I thought he was going to run, you know, and he didn't. We both sat there and cried and cried. And he still told me, he's like, you've got this. And my dad came, my mom. My mom, um, it was a little rough. Um, we had a certain relationship, and I had to ask her to leave because of some things that were said uh, while I was in the hospital. And she apologized later. But it. my dad said all the right you know, he said all the right things and he's like, I've got you. I'm here for you. You know, never made me feel like a failure. Um, and I got out of there. Dave was like, I took all the liquor out of the house. And my best friend was like, you're not drinking. And I was like, shoot, like I can't because they're saying I can't. And look what I just put them through. So I went, I didn't go back to AA though. I was like, nope, not going that road because someday I will drink again. So I went six weeks and I started running every day. And I lost, I think like 15, 20 pounds over that six weeks, like not drinking. And, you know, I was actually taking care of myself. But the thought in my mind was I'm just going to make it a certain amount of time and then I'll start, you know, I'll be able to control it. So I tried. It was so what that was August, like maybe beginning or mid October. I tried to start again, ended up right back where I, I couldn't control it. You know, it starts with, oh, I'll have just one glass of wine when we go out to dinner. Well, then I'm going to have, but I won't ever drink at home. Then I wanted to drink at home. I'll have one glass of wine, Dave. You better believe I poured the big, like I went and bought a bigger wine glass, you know, so that it was only one glass. And, you know, just, I started, it was going down the same road. So my last day I ever drank was, um, November, so it would have been like November 27th. And I had been going, there was a board um, studio, board creation studio that had opened in Roscoe. And I had went three times with my friends. And I was working for a financial advisor in sales at the time, very part-time, because like if I was hungover or whatever, it wouldn't matter if I didn't go, you know, it was very part-time. And um, I'd done sales most of my life. And um, I went to a class this Sunday night to make a new board. And I I had too much wine and um, I had this crazy thought. I'm like, I could do these parties, these board creation parties and women's garages and basements on my own, you know, and charge a little bit less and actually do something for a living that I liked. And I talk, totally talked myself into it right then. Like, that's the way my brain works. Like, let's just do it now, you know. And I was drinking. And so I, I texted my boss, who was also a friend, thank God. And this is so embarrassing. I quit my job, like, right then. Like, I'm like, I'm, because this is the what I did, you know. I didn't think things through. And I was like, I'm going to start this, you know, board business. So I go home. I walk in the house. And Dave and the kids are there. They could tell I was drunk. And I'm like, I quit my job. Like, I'm going to start this. And they all looked at me like, oh, shoot. Now she's really done it. Mom's drunk again. You know, this is what. And so um, I went to bed. I woke up the next day hungover. And something in my mind was like, this is your freaking chance to get your act together. You, you've done this now. It's too late. You quit your job and you know you're not totally happy there and you're capable of more, but alcohol is what's holding you back. So I never took a drink again and I got my butt to AA and my uncle, um, my mom's brother has been sober for 20 some years. Well, when I had went the other times, he was always like, you should come with me to a meeting in Janesville. And I was like, oh heck no, because then he's going to stay on me and ask me how I'm doing and I'm going to be accountable. And I didn't want that. Well, this time I knew that something had to change or I wasn't going to make it. I mean, my relationship was with Dave was so strained. My kids just thought 
you know, I was always a good mom, but I wasn't, they wouldn't talk to me about things. At a certain time of the night, when I had too much to drink, my daughter would shut down. You know, she was 13 or whatever. She would shut down, go into her room. Sure. Yeah. And so I was like, this is my chance. So I um, went to the Jane, uh, Janesville AA meeting with my uncle, mm -hmm. and I met some women that, were just amazing and you know just took me under their wings and the one became my sponsor and you know I remember meeting for coffee with her like a week and a half into being sober and she was on the phone planning this trip to Mexico with all these other women from AA for one of their 30th birthdays and she's like okay yeah it's gonna be so much fun you know blah 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 and I'm like this lady has lost her damn mind they're going to Mexico where it's all inclusive like they are so losing money on this trip like who goes to Mexico and doesn't drink you know and I looked at them and I'm like but she's happy you know like she has what I want mm. so I'm gonna do what she says and I did and I was broke but I asked for the machine to start printing the stencils for the board business from Dave for Christmas as an early Christmas present and he bought it for me and I I just did not give up. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of self-confidence issues because I didn't believe in myself. Sure. I mean, I was terrified every day that I was going to go back to drinking. Right. But I didn't. And, you know, now, three years later, I, I mean, I have the best relationships. I mean, I got married to Dave mm -hmm. when it was the right time. Yeah. Not because I needed someone to complete me, mm -hmm. We both say this, you know, I believe that there's a lot of different people in life that you could fall in love with. Sure. I do, depending on where you are in the world at, at that time. But we both say, you know, we, could we get by without each other? Sure, we could. But we make each other's lives better. Mm -hmm. You know, waking up every day with him. And so we got married when it was the right time for us, right. when I fixed myself and we were truly partners instead of, you know, him feeling like he was always trying to pick up the pieces from me and where I felt like we had this mutual respect, you know, and my relationships with my kids. Oh my gosh. Like my daughter is my best friend. And, you know, when I got positive and changed my whole way of thinking through AA and getting sober, her way of thinking, she will tell, tell me, you know, high school is rough. Mm -hmm. And she's a senior and she will say, mom, you changing changed me. I mean, she has a dream board. She puts positive quotes next to her bed. And, you know, the relationships with my kids are amazing and my friends and that business I started, I feel like it, it was God's hand in things because making those boards, sanding, staining, painting, when I first tried to get sober, I had so much anxiety inside of me. I mean, I, I would sit up at night until midnight and just paint because I couldn't think about anything else then. And I loved what I was creating and it slowed my brain down mm -hmm. and it saved me. And then I started to make money at it, mm -hmm. you know, and I started to connect with other women. Mind you that all the women at the parties drink, mm -hmm. but I knew that if I picked up a drink, it wouldn't be the end. The way that I look at it is that my whole life is in that glass of wine mm -hmm. or that bottle of beer. My entire life is in that first one. Mm -hmm. And I did parties in gra uh, women's garages and basements until like... Um, that August. And then I got into the local winery, um, which is funny, but you know, I, I, women like to drink. And so, you know, it was a good place to have it. And then my business kept growing. And then I opened up my own shop, um, in Rockton two years ago. And it just, I have employees now. Um, I spoke at a, um, state line chamber of commerce event on women overcoming obstacles. I have slowly started to become okay with sharing my story. Okay. You know, I was worried about what people would think of me, especially trying to start a business. Yeah. So I waited a while. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I don't even recognize that 
that person that I used to be. So, so question for you. As we that was a lot. Sorry. Oh, no, no, you did a phenomenal <laughs> job. And, and um, it is one of the things that um, it, is, it seems to be a theme, right? That just like you talked about, it's, it's more than one thing that's, that's happened. Obviously, the alcohol had to stop to start <laughs> the new life, right? right. It, but there also had to be something that gave you a sense of purpose, a sense of mm-hmm. more. And it also had to help with this transition, this, this, as you talked about the anxiety, it was more than a medication, more than a substance. It was an activity, and it was it was bigger than yourself. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. So tell us, tell me if you can, in a matter of like two minutes or so. Oh Lord. Tell me about the relationship with God now. Oh, um, so when I went into AA, you know, I told my sponsor, I'm like, I told her my background with it. And I'm like, I can't do the God thing. Like you talking to me about God is foreign and, you know, and so she act, actually, she's amazing. She looked up some information on the internet about people who had grown up in the religion that I did and who were alcoholics. Mm-hmm. And it helped her to understand mm-hmm. the way that my brain, you know, worked with that. So at first, she said, can your higher power not be God? Um, Who can your higher power be? It has to be something greater than yourself that that like cares about you and that you can talk to and that you believe has some control when when you want to pick up that drink you know and I she goes could it be your brother Hmm. and I said it could and so for that first bit of time um when I struggled I talked to my brother and um it got me through and then One of the things, and I meant to bring it today and forgot, I brought like a little magnet I keep on the fridge with one of my favorite quotes that helps me, but I read the book, The Shack. Mm -hmm. It changed me. And it was about almost a year into being sober. And I was still having some trouble wrapping my head around the God thing. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of trouble. And um, I read that book and I thought, what if... The way I grew up isn't right. You know, all these people in the world think that their concept of God is right. And in the end, maybe they are right. Maybe the way I grew up is right. But it wasn't right for me. And if I didn't find a different concept of God, I was going to die. Mm -hmm. And so... I read that book, and it changed the way that I thought about God. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to pray again to God. Um, I also read the book Present Over Perfect, and she says something in there about imagining God as a big heart, and that love just radiates out. And, you know, I started to just feel, every morning I woke up, and I was like, okay, envision that. Envision the love coming towards you from God. And um, then I started to get blessings. Blessings in my life that I knew weren't by chance. I knew it was because I was changing my life. And I knew that it was from someone, you know, bigger than that I could imagine. And also the women that started to come my way because I was sharing my story and I was able to start helping them. And I would, their kids were like, oh, my mom's starting to be a different person. I knew that like, I'm not that important. That was God using me to help them. Right. You know, <clears throat> I think the, the the book The Shack, and then later is turned into a movie. Um, I still haven't seen that. I need to see it. You, you, I think you would enjoy it. It's it's a yeah. it's a good metaphor. It's a good illustration of, and I think you said it for anyone who's listening that's struggling with religious abuse mm-hmm. um, and emotional abuse. Um, the idea of what if, right? Mm-hmm. The, the just giving yourself permission to ask the question, what if it could be different? Yep. Can then open us up to Jen be curious. Right, yep. um, Erica. As we, you've done a phenomenal job, and thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> I'm so nervous. If if there was one thing that you would want uh, anybody who might be listening to know, what what would you want to share? Uh, um, I guess that there's a better life out there. Um, to face your demons, and um, you know. There's you. You have to do the work, though. Mm-hmm. Um, every day is not good for me. You know, um, I'm very positive about what I post on Facebook and the way I try to talk to people. And some people say, "Oh, it's easy for you to not drink now because your life's so good." <laughs> 
And I want to say, you don't know what I went through mm-hmm. in, in the work I still put in, mm-hmm. you know, to stay that way. Um, but, but you are beautiful inside and worth so much if you can just you know dig up you got to you got to sort through those wounds and it hurts it hurts it's hard and life is not fun at first getting sober it's not fun at all but there is such a better life um waiting out there and it's beautiful and the things that make me you know, high on life now. My husband made me laugh two weeks ago. I went to Great America with my best friend and our kids, and her and I just went around the park all day. We rolled the little people cars, and everyone was laughing at us, and my husband saw the picture later, and he was dying laughing. He goes, those people that were watching probably thought you guys were high. And he goes, they just don't know you're high on life, right? And I started, I go, Dave, I really am. You know, the things that, that make me happy are things that are good for my soul now. But it wasn't like that when I first quit. You you, you have to put in the work and you have to look for the beauty and the simple things. And can I read this real sure. quick? Yeah. Okay. So this, like when I help a lot of the, the women that I help or when I'm struggling inside, because when you get upset inside, that's when you want to drink. That's when you like, you can't find peace inside and you want to reach for something else. And, um, so I bought this at, at one of the AA like conventions that I went to and I leave it on the refrigerator and I can and like almost quote it word for word, but it's um, acceptance. It says, and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my alcohol I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and my attitude. So I always try to look within myself because I can't control what anybody around me does. But I can control what goes on in here and what goes on in my head. And that helps me to have peace every single day and take it one day at a time. Sure. Erica, um, your story is uh, very inspirational. And thank you for b- being vulnerable and being authentic and sharing today. Um, I, I look forward to hearing more stories uh, <laughs> about you and how, how you do and how you impact other individuals. If someone wanted to re- uh, reach you um, or mm-hmm. come to your shop, uh, uh-huh. what's the best way to, for them to either get in contact with you or, uh-huh. or, or your shop? What's the name of your shop? So my shop is Erica's Board Creation. Okay. I always say now I should have named it like something fancier or like, you know, a funny name. But when I started this, I didn't think it was going to work. So I was like, oh, Erica's board creations will work. So um, we're on Facebook. Our website's almost done. Okay. Um, but that was a big investment. So I sure. did things a little at a time. Um, we're in Rockton. Otherwise, on Facebook, it's uh, Erica Sharon, C-H-A-R-R-O-N. So you can friend me on there. And of a lot of people have messaged. And of course, I, you know, keep it between us if you're struggling and everything. But, you know, I I'm always here, you know, to listen and I can just share what worked for me. Perfect, Erica. Thank you very much for being here. And again, thank you for sharing your story and also sharing um, what you've been doing and doing not only for yourself, but for other people. Thank again, you. thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, listening to Eric's Erica's story of not only the struggle, but then also what was the piece that allowed her um, to have a new relationship with God, to have purpose in her life, but but most importantly, to choose to be the woman she wanted to be and the mother and wife she wanted to be. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next week.